Hey everybody, it's Richard Harris with Scott Lease on another exciting episode of the Circle Sales Podcast. Joining us today, we have a guy I've gotten to know quite a bit over the last few years, um, both in the sales capacity and just sort of been able to hang out. So it, it's fun to welcome, you know, someone that I, I mean, I think everybody's a friend, but someone I've really spent some time with. So Brian Smith, who's an account executive over at Vendition. So Brian, thanks for joining us. Yeah, man, I appreciate you guys having me. I feel like I'm in super, super good company. So excited about this. Cool. Good to, uh, good to talk to you. Richard, do you know the story of how Brian and I met for the first time? No, I want to hear it. Brian, you want to tell a story or me? No, I want to hear, I want to hear how you tell it. Okay, well, basically, Brian and I meet for the first time uh, in February at uh, the Flip the Script event that he, he went to. <clears throat> now, he got like... Oh, just like a few months ago, like in February 2020. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I didn't know this, but yeah, I thought he was like a part of the thing. He was like, no, I was just, uh, you know, at the event in Atlanta and they were like, you should totally come with us. And so he just like packed a bag and basically just went on the rest of the, the rest of the trip. And, uh, I'm meeting him for the first time and I'm like, totally, totally like pushing his buttons, like try to find, you know, what to do with him, his life and in his career and next steps and all this kind of stuff. And uh, I'm like, Hey man, like, you know, give me, give me, give me your number and try to see what I can do try to try to help you out. And uh, like, you know, he, he was, we had a good chat and hung out. And then like the next day, I think I'm like texting him shit. Cause I have ideas and people and he's, and he was basically like, damn, you actually did do what you, you know, said you were going to do or whatnot. You're, you're kind of a good dude. So we had, we had a good, like, first That's all. face-to-face That's kind of cool. encounter. But it's Brian. all because he just randomly decided to join the Flip the Script tour. Yeah, I, I just want to know, how did you pull that, how did you pull off that sales job with your wife? Because I know you got a kid, uh, married. Yeah. Like, that, to me, is the ultimate sales job, which is awesome that you did it. Not that I didn't want you to meet Scott, but, wow, how would you pull that off? Yeah, there's a couple of things that come to come to mind when I think about that, man. Uh, to be brutally honest, right? Honesty is key. I was in a tough place, man, in my career. Uh, I was ready to hang up the sales gloves. Like I was like, yo, this shit is awful. Um, I've had the highs, the lows, and from the beginning of my career, I knew I needed to be level-headed. Like there's going to be ups and downs. But at that point, man, uh, I guess February, like there were a lot of downs. Um, and the highs weren't enough to, I feel like, keep me afloat. And so I think my wife is a pretty open couple. I think her realizing that, but still knowing I was super passionate about it, I think the minute I told her I had this opportunity, of course she pushed back a little bit, like, who's on this bus? How many people? And, you know, every good wife is like, any pretty girls on that bus? So, but she... uh it wasn't a hard sell, man, because of where I was at and just her awareness of my internal battle with my career at the time. Um, well, first so, of all, as, thanks to your wife. Well, cheers to your wife and <laughs> partner. We could probably do a whole episode on how do you find a good partner, right? Yeah, Take for sure. Sales. Um, yeah. So thank her for all of us, because I think that, that means a lot when you know you've got a good partner behind you. Um, oh, yeah, for sure. What what were some of those challenges you like? What were those lows that were hard? Were they just droughts in sales? Was it a, a imposter syndrome confidence thing, which I suffer from a lot? What what was it for you? I'm gonna try not to sugarcoat anything. It was a lot of things, right? Uh, I think it was bullcrap uh, goals and metrics that I was set up to try and hit, and there was no way. Like you you find out there's a metric set, and I get there's context around it, but there's sometimes things set up, goals that like you were never intended to hit. Um, and I think as a rep, if you don't have context, you think, okay, this is obviously possible, but I'm not doing it, but I'm giving it my all and I've had success doing this very same thing. And then that spiraled into the imposter syndrome. Like maybe I wasn't as good as I thought I was, or maybe, you know, everything was luck or just my hustle. Um, overcompensated for the lack of intelligence in the sales industry. So like, I just had this big, big battle, man, um, that started from losing two jobs in like eight months, but having record breaking deals closed, 
the fastest, the largest at both these companies. And so I think that kind of started the spiral then. Yeah. How how have you um battled back and kind of overcome that? I mean it's demoralizing, right? To feel like yeah. you're doing really well and have companies kind of implode underneath you or not recognize your value and then set you up to fail potentially with you know bogus kind of comp plan goals or kpi goals like how what have you done to try to reclaim your career right and and your and your happiness and and all that kind of stuff yeah i don't know if i'm 100 percent there yet but the steps i've taken man is I've really honed in on the simple thing of control, what you can control. And what I mean by that is I had to look back and say, did I do everything in my power and my ability and my capability to meet that expectation? And I think when you look and you challenge yourself, like, yo, were you bullshitting or did it really, you know, did you really give your all? And so I think challenging myself mentally, internally, um, to the aspect of did I give my all because that's kind of helped me reshape my career and I think the biggest thing is you know once you fail you learn real quick what to look out for and what not to get into um, so I think that's the two biggest things that come to mind what are what are a couple of things that you've really executed on differently once you once you had that self-awareness and you dove in deep right what do you remember the two or three things that you're like okay in order to now that i recognize this as the problem here's what i'm doing to solve it or to work on it because a lot of it's just we're all the work in progress right yeah and, and let me just clarify you mean internally like what did i do to help myself recognize those those things to look out for yeah either way yeah yeah i think a couple of different things um I really started paying attention to who was leading me. I'll admit I did a poor job and whether it was ignorance or the lack of knowledge, I just did a poor job and really not that any of my leaders were bad that I had before. I just don't know from my skill set and what I wanted from my career if I really took a deep dive and in interviewing the person that was trying to hire me to figure out if they were really the right person. So that's one, that's one thing I learned really quickly. Two. Um, I need to start taking my own advice. I used to always tell my buddies, Morgan being one, I always preach that a part of success was being at the right company at the right time in the right seat. Um, so that's another thing I just started evaluating, right? Where's this company at? What are your goals in the next couple of years, right? Have you raised any money? Do you plan on doing that? Um, that's probably the second. And then the third, I really just had to get into something that I actually believed in. I think for two years or so, I was selling some stuff that I didn't necessarily believe in. It was just a job, like a means to an end. So what did you, what did you do you know, moving forward, right? What kind of things did you start looking for in your new leader? Right. What kind of things? Because you, you, I think you nailed it, and, and we've all done this, right? I don't. You're not ignorant. You're, your ignorance may just be through lack of experience, which we've all gone through, right? It's it's not like you're dumb. It's just we just don't know yet. What are the things you've decided are the right kinds of leader for you? Yeah. Um, <laughs> trying to get in trouble with this, but don't tell me that something works and you haven't figured out it works yourself. If you're telling me you need me to make a hundred calls, I need to see you do it at least once. Willing, now again, there's some context around that, right? Sure. Some organizations are in a place where a VP, director, manager can't do that. Yeah. But well, yeah, again, I'm, coming I'm, from reminded, I'm reminded right now of uh, the episode of Last Dance the other day. And Michael Jordan was like, I never asked one of my teammates to do something that exactly. I wasn't willing to do myself. Exactly. <laughs> got a whole, I've got a whole post on that. I've yeah. got a whole post on that on that that I wrote immediately when I saw that I was just like that's what I believe in and um this quick shout out like the manager I'm under Nick White right now like anything the dude tells us to do he does it like he tests it um and so that's the first time in my career where I've experienced that um so yeah man I think I think that's the biggest thing is like 
I need to know that there's a validity in what I'm about to do, not what some you, made up theory. Yeah. What? Um, so now that you've, you've made that transition, right? What are the things you're excited about? Like, you know, and I know it's tough too with COVID, right? And everything that's going yeah. on, you know, in your head, now that you've made this recognition, you've made this positive spin, you've owned, you know, you've taken accountability for what you need yeah. to do and you're still moving forward. Now what's exciting you and sort of relighting your passion for sales again? <laughs> oh man, it's a good question. Uh, I think a couple of different things, man. I think community is a big thing. And I, I wrote a post about this, but having people like Scott, Richard, you, that Colin, you know, when you tell people like, yo, I'm hanging it up and they go, no, you're not. It's like, whoa, like, what do you see that I don't see? Right. I think that's the number one thing is when, um, the community surrounds you because they see something in you that ignited my passion. So if I could tell anybody, man, get a community that you can trust. There's going to be hard times, right? So um, let me, can I, can I ask you about that? Because I had this conversation or maybe Richard was with me even, I can't even remember to be honest with you, but we were talking about the need to find a community, but some people don't know where to look or how to find a, a community. So what, what advice would you give, people to like go find this community or, or these particular folks that, you know, can help you kind of stay in the game and get your mind right and whatnot. How do you find them? Oh, that's a tough thing, right? Um, how do you find them? I think you got to be a good prospector at the end of the day. And what I mean by that is like um, something I've uh, contributed my success in sales my short stint in sales is paying attention to patterns. And so, how do I say this? There's a similarity in the Beck Collins, the Scott Lee's, the Richard Harris's. You all are doing something that each one of you do very similar. And so if you can find that pattern, whether it's this person is always real with me every time I ask a question, this person is always real with me every time I ask a question, or this person always responds, you know what I mean? So it's finding those patterns um, that one person, so if Scott inspired me in a certain way, I'm going to go find another leader that maybe, maybe not doing the same exact thing that Scott's doing or Richard's doing, but they have the same type of patterns that I can follow and know. Does that make sense? I hope I explained that correctly, but I think that's the quickest way to find community. Yeah, find I, mean, one I, person I think that, you said differently. Maybe you like, you identify particular qualities in people. Oh yeah. And then, how do I go find those similar qualities in somebody else? Or I start to look for those qualities, right? So like if, if I have a conversation with Brian and like Brian is super passionate and like talks a mile a minute and I get energized by that, as I go look for somebody else to, you know, talk to about business and sales, and I talk to Richard and he also talks fast and loud like that, that's a similar kind of attribute. And I'm like, okay, I need that kind of energy in my life, right? Yeah, for example. For me, like, I don't need you to hold my hand. Like, you know what I mean? So anybody I talk to, if you try to hold my hand, like, oh, man, I understand. And it's okay. That's not what I need. I need you to tell me, Francis, Scott, and I talk. And I ask Scott a question about, like, yo, like, what do we say to people during this COVID thing trying to sell? And Francis Scott said, was like, fuck, I don't know. We're figuring it out. That's what I needed. So, like, you know, every other person every that has some type of influence on me, if I asked him that question, it was almost borderline the same like we're figuring this shit out so what were i hope you, that helps like as a as a kid growing up were you you know you know were you the competitive kid were you hustling always sort of you know lemonade standing it or you know whatever how what were you like as a kid that made you decide to go into sales man So maybe I should reverse engineer this. I should start by saying I had no idea I was going to go on the sales. Nobody, like most, people, most people don't. Right. Um, you know, I really think I was, uh, how do I explain this? I don't know if I was necessarily the hustler, but I was always willing to find the most efficient and quickest way to success, whether it was in sports. Perfect example. I was never the tallest. I was never the biggest which is some people might be surprised now, but I was a pretty small guy in high school, play on defensive line, but I would find in a more efficient way to get to the quarterback. 
right? Like coaches were teaching me, hey, head up with guys, knock them back. And I was just like, yo, at 215 pounds, I'm not knocking anybody back. So I made it to where I could get literally get down the spin move so quick. I was the only one allowed on the team to do a spin move in high school football. And so me as a kid, that's what I was always about, right? I fucking suck at cold calling. So I'm going to find out what I'm great at. I'm going to double down on that. That's what I was like as a kid all the time, right? I was terrible at math. I overcompensated and tried to get a really high grade in English. So it made up for my GPA because I was going to be terrible at math. Um, and some of that might be like just my background, right? I went through foster care and stuff like that. So maybe just like having that experience, it was always like, I'm going to be terrible at something. What can I do and maximize to equal out the bad? If that makes sense. I didn't, I didn't know that was your background. So I, I appreciate your openness to it. Yeah. Um, when did you, so what made you even, so when, as you became an adult, right? Yeah. Uh, started adulting and started to look into sales or careers. What made you lean into that? Yeah, I think, um, I thought I was going into logistics right out of college. Um, I had this one company I wanted to work for, put everything on the table. I think I did four, three hour interviews. Got down to me and another guy, and maybe this is where the competitiveness start. I was always competitive because in sports, but never really had a chip on my shoulder till right after college. But the company said, hey, we went with this other guy because he seemed more serious about sales. We don't know if you're serious about sales. And immediately I was like, at that point, like I, again, was a logistics job. Um, and so I was like, I'm not serious about sales. Well, you may be right, but that just made me serious about sales. Um, so after I pouted, of course, for about a week, you know, somebody told me, get my stuff together. Man, I took a trip with my wife to Atlanta, heard about this SDR job, like what is SDR? Somebody gave me some quick background on it. And I said, hey, I think I could do this and I could be good at it. Um, so I applied to a job, man, on the way home, got lucky. Two weeks later, got an offer, packed up two bins with my wife, put it in the car, and moved to Atlanta. Like, no looking back. So I think it was just, one, a chip on my shoulder from not getting that first job. Two, um, I'm not going to do something unless I think I can be great at it, right? Like when people always say, hey, I'll challenge you to – I don't know, Scott says, you want to challenge me to a PK contest? Hell no, I can't kick PK. Like, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not about to do that. That's stupid. I'm going to lose. Like, I'm not going to put myself in a losing situation. You, so. you, you touched on the getting into the, <clears throat> the STR role. And, um, yeah. you know, you were good at that STR role. You got promoted into an STR, you know, team lead role. What I also find interesting, though, is that you've been an AE for years you've been in charge of partnerships you know where you are now and running channel sales and that type of thing i don't think that maybe i'm wrong i don't know that there's that many people that could be successful at each of those different type of individual contributor kind of roles the sdr yeah. the ae the channel sale partnership stuff which one of those is is the hardest Give me, give me a non-political answer. Like, which one of those roles is, is, is the hardest, do you think, right now and why? Mm, which one's the hardest right now and why? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Uh, the SDR gig is the hardest. Boom. Tell us why. I, I, tell us why. I, I'll tell you why. People have so much information now. Before you had to talk to somebody to get information, it was like a secret, right? It was almost like a speakeasy if you wanted to find out about the new sexy thing that was out. Now, people have, I mean, it's crazy. Like almost like sometimes on calls now, it's like they already know what they want. It's just a matter of building a good enough relationship for them to actually choose me over the guy next door that they're talking to also. Um, so when people are already equipped with information, you're no longer introducing a revelation to them. Now you're digging through what do you actually know? How do you truly think this is going to help you? And realistically, from my expertise, is that valid or not? And I need to help you bring you to the actuality 
within that product, software, service, or what have you, as an SDR. I hope that made sense. That was kind of off the cuff. I hadn't thought uh, about that. That's good. I've, I've been on record um, more than once saying that of all the roles right now, I think that the SDR role is the hardest. <clears throat> but I, I haven't been in that that role, and I haven't been in an AE you know role for for a while. So you know, my 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 point of view is maybe irrelevant one could could argue because I've, I've been too far removed from the game so it's 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 good for me to ask somebody like you who's been in the trenches and is making these calls and doing these roles right now every single day for the last three or four years um yeah. which one you feel you know is, is is the toughest and your answer was is the is the same as mine so um I appreciate just, just for credibility i've been a full cycle rep the last three years so i'm still hunting and closing just for a little bit of credibility. Isn't that, isn't, is, is that the role that's the most fun? Do you, the I, full I, cycle? When I, when I was, when I was a, a, a rep, it was full cycle, right? And most of, almost every organization I've been a full-time operator at, we did yeah. not have SDR, AE kind of dynamics. It was all full cycle. Yeah. So I, I wonder if that full cycle role is the most fun because you get to do a little bit of everything. Yeah, and I think you, there's a, again, if we go back to why it's hard, there's a trust factor with people already having inf enough information. I've talked to you and now you want to pass me off. Like, already ha I already pretty much know what I need. I'm coming to you to validate it almost. That, that's, again, this is just my opinion. Um, so I think that's why it's more fun, right? Because I get to build a relationship over a course of a sales process. And that turns into, and again, I've learned this the last couple of years, if you're smart, that's a client in long term, right? If you stay within your lane, stay within MarTech, if you've always been in MarTech, that person's going to move. You're going to move. They buy again because the relationship's there. And I think that only happens, not only, majority of the time it happens if you're a full cycle rep. Hey, y'all get me fired up over here. I'm just like, you know, I've been fired up in a while. <laughs> that's good we're, we're wondering we're like is he gonna you know is he, is he, we, we were trying to figure it out what um what do you see you know, where do you see yourself going what do you want to do right um you know as as because i i still see you as a thought leader you post a ton on linkedin you bring value to the community as a whole i know how important community is do you do you are you the guy who's going to be like you know what i've been in you know i'm a full cycle rep I, I like being a full cycle rep and I, I don't want to worry about management and managing people and hiring and coaching or, or do you want to, or do you were like, no, I actually do want to go do that. Like what, what, do you, what kind of things do you, you know, excite you about the future? Yeah. I've got a chip on my shoulder about that, man. Um, again, I'm not sugarcoating. I'm trying to get into leadership the last two and a half years. Um, it's very similar to what graduating college, the first company that gives me a chance, like, Every person that passed me up or didn't give me a shot, I'm going to make them regret it. Yeah. I love teaching. It's my favorite. It's my favorite thing in the world when somebody's light bulb goes off. That's where I get like my, like, I can't tell how many conversations I've had with reps because, and not specifically this job I'm in now, but my previous jobs at some point in time when I was getting burned out, the only reason why I was able to make it through the week is because I was giving free coaching away to some young kid or a person sent me a message and asked me, hey, I'm having trouble with this. How do I do it? That was keeping me going along. So I'd love to be a management man. I don't know what it looks like exactly. If it's a direct manager, if it's, you know, if it's a trainer, I don't, you know, I, I know I love teaching. You know, I was a teacher for two years and a coach before I got into sales. So, so, so let me ask you this, because I'll, I'll be, yeah. I'll be the guy who interviews you. What are you doing now to get yourself ready for that next role? How are you investing? That's a, that's a great question. Um, you know, personally, man, I, anybody that asks for help, um, I had a guy reach out to me the other day that was trying to, you know, not the other day, but about 30 days ago, I was trying to build an outbound process. Yeah, I'll help you. Like, right, I'm sharpening my skills. The money will come, right? Uh, you can, just like this interview, he get on the phone with me real quick or, put me to the test and find out if I really know what I'm talking about. So it's just doing stuff for free. It's testing stuff out. Asking my boss, hey, I got this idea, right? I've got this idea. Can I test it? Um, 
so yeah, I'm, I'm doing a lot of different things now in my spare time to get ready for that. That's good. <clears throat> what do you think are the things that, I mean, you've been through the interview process a, a few times in terms of getting into, you know, sales leadership, right? What, what have those experiences been, been like for you thus far? Uh, they haven't been bad. But what is it? What is the interview process like? I'm, 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 I'm asking questions because, you know, a large part of our audience are SDRs and, and AEs and presumably yeah. some of them want to get into sales leadership roles. And, you know, maybe you can talk from your recent experience. Like, what is the interview process like? What are the questions being, you know, thrown your way? What are the things you're tripping you up? Why do you think people, you know, haven't given you a shot yet? I mean, any, any, anything in, in this arena is, uh, you know, potentially really, really, really helpful for, for people to yeah. listen to. Yeah, I think the main thing people want to know, uh, can you execute? Um, and not can you just come up with a theory, but can you put together an actual playbook and run it? Um, at the end of the day, it's about results and sales. Like, we could talk about theory and possibilities all day long, but at the end of the day, it's about results. Um, so that's the number one thing. The second thing is, can you actually lead people? Can you lead the guy or gal that just can't get over the hump? Right? Um, can you communicate in a way to different personalities? That's something, you know, I think some of the best managers really dig into that. Like, can you actually lead people, you know, and they're not all uh, A players, right? Can you lead two A players and five C players? And these, um, these questions, I feel like, you know, are softballs for, for you, right? Yeah. Amount of, we, we, don't, we haven't met or spent that much time together, but we've chatted a number of times, and I'm like, that's a softball question for Brian. Like, Brian just fucking took that one over the fence in center field. What's, what's the question that is a little trickier or, or, a, or a little harder or where you look back on the interview and be like, fuck, you know, I, I, I didn't get this gig. I wonder if – my answer to this particular question, um, you know, could have been better. Are you, have you, are you been able to identify that? Yeah, I think the biggest one that probably keeps tripping me up is the what if, right? Everybody comes to the table with a plan. What happens when that plan goes to shit, right? So what, what, what do you do? Like you, all, everything I'm saying, right? You want to follow these methodologies. You want to follow this type of process, which is what your playbook will like. Let's say it doesn't work the first quarter. What do you do? And unfortunately, like, I truly haven't had enough experience to, I think, probably communicate. Not that I couldn't do it or pivot, right? I'm pivoting every day. Like, I'm a sales rep. We've gone through COVID. Like, I think the ability to communicate in a way that aligns with that VP of sales or that leader's goals is what trips me up. And that may just be lack of experience. Maybe I just need to do some more research. But the ability, because Again, sales is always changing. Always. Yeah. Well, how, how, how would you answer that question, Richard? Maybe you can give Brian a little bit of coaching here. Like, you know, you're, you're in the uh, situation where the interview process is, like, difficult. You're getting asked, hey, if things go to, if things go to shit and your plan blows up, right? It's like the Mike Tyson quote, right? Everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. I think, exactly. I think that's the quote, something like that. Um, so how do you, how do you improvise and change on the fly? Well, I turn around and sort of try and say, so what is it you want? What is it that you need this to be done to make you better at your job? Right. If I'm apply, if I'm talking to the VP of sales, like, and, and it may come in sooner than the moment you're in this interview. But my first thing is, is when they say, what kind of questions do you have? My first question is often, you know, what is it that you need from somebody, um, that, will help you do your job and let you feel like you can let, you can not worry about this anymore. Right. And asking them that question is usually pretty deep and it's meaningful and supportive to them. They appreciate it. And then based on their answer, you then can pull from your say, Oh, I've done that here. I've done that here. I solved that here. I love solving that. So now you're, you're really sort of positioning it so that they're not just going through their same seven or eight questions that everybody goes through. Right. So for me, that's, that's the key. I think the key um, in the interview isn't when they're asking you questions and checking shit off the list. You win the interview when you start asking them questions and you ask them better questions 
about themselves, their role, the challenges they face, how this role helps solve the challenges and what kind of person you want in that role. And then I can demonstrate those things to you, right? Um, because that's what they want, right? Yeah. They want someone who can come in every day and say, what's on your plate today and how can I help you? Right. That's what every VP of sales wants their managers to do in a lot of ways. Not all the time, but you know, so, and sometimes it's don't bother me, go do your job. I don't need you to do anything for me, which is great. You know, that's cool. So for me, I sort of flip it the other way around. The interviews won when you start asking questions. Yeah, that's good. I, I think you, you hit something, hit the nail on the head, man. And I, I think uh, we treat the interview process as a robotic and it's really an art form. It's a dance. And uh, just like any person, the more you dance, the better you get. Some of us, at least, you know, some people just got too. Some much people music. just can never dance. I can. I have. Yeah. I have no dance moves whatsoever. I have no rhythm. It, it ain't happening. And it, and, find a better, find again, a better that, analogy. I need a better analogy. It, well, that well, no. There's more to that, right? Maybe like I'm just in the wrong dance. Like maybe after I do this a couple more times, maybe I'm not supposed to be a manager. Like maybe I'm supposed to make a bunch of freaking money and be okay with that for the rest of my life as an individual contributor. I don't know. Nah, you, uh, you have you have a passion for teaching, so you're gonna you're gonna find a way to take the knowledge that's in your head and the the lessons that you've learned along the way, uh, yeah. and you know you just need one shot, like you said. Now, I can I can remember thinking that way, right? I can remember thinking that way when I was first trying to get my uh, my foot in the door in, in sales, and I can remember being asked the question, you know, why should I why should I hire you? You've never done this job before. In fact, you've never had any job in business before. And, and I, I said, like, somebody's going to take a chance on me. And that person, you know, is going to is going to be blessed with somebody who's about to run circles and run through a wall and do whatever it takes type of thing. And, you know, I think sure. if you maintain that mindset, Brian, and that and that attitude is going to serve you, you know, really well. Yeah, for sure. I appreciate that. I got another tip for you, Brian. I'm I'm gonna I'm going deep on your LinkedIn profile right now. Scott will, oh, Scott no. will disagree with me, but as I look at your LinkedIn profile, right, it, it's all written about you or your company. It's not about your accomplishments, yeah. right? So even at Vendition, it's like you know average sales cycle, average deal size part of this size team, help on board 14 reps, like whatever it is that you've done that shows that leadership stuff. Same as this, the, the piece at, at, um, at enterprise sales, like give people something that makes them go, Oh, I want to, I want to hear that story. Right. That to me is what I think LinkedIn is, is it's your place to tell your story. And I always sort of say everything is numbers first, like 101, you know, Q2 2020 goal achievement. Uh, 98% Q4 2019 goal achievement, whatever it is, so that they kind of see some level of success that says, okay, this, this person knows this. And then talk about, give the story of, oh, I onboarded this many reps, right? I remember when I first, when I, my very first job out of college, I worked for The Gap. And in two days, I had to go open The Gap Kids store, or in two days, I had to interview. I scheduled like 60 15 minute interviews because it was retail it wasn't that hard you know in two days at the age of 23 and that was one of the very first things on my resume when people would look at me for management i'm like yeah I, not only did i do a bunch i did them in you know two days which blows people's minds right so they know that i have a story to tell there right so that's one thing that i think um would be supportive to you is, is give them a little yeah. bit more meat on the bone you know sure. give them more sizzle i mean give them more steak not sizzle yeah, well, I do. Sure. I think some of that is that imposter syndrome, no, right? And I not want to make myself to leave Vendition in case those guys are listening. Like, we're not trying to get Brian. <laughs> right? That's not our goal. Uh, our, our goal is to just, you know, let people listen and 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 learn from it. So, yeah, Vendition is a good place, man. They it's the first place in a long time that I felt like I'm a part of a family, man. And I'll tell you, you can get that. You will run through walls for people, man. Like. You know, staying up late at night to figure this out isn't as bad when I know my kids are going to be a because, you know, they've embraced me. So, yeah, yeah man. <laughs> well, we're, we're, we're wrapping up here towards the end, end of the show. We always like to end the show with, uh, you know, an offer to, to help and what we can do to help you and support you and, and, and your goals and the things you're working on. So um, is there anything that you're, you've got going on that you're like, hey, 
maybe Scott and Richard could help me out. Yeah, there's a couple of things, but so wait, do I get one thing, two things, three things you, this Christmas? Like you, what? You what? Many things you want? Oh, you know. like a genie. You get three wishes. <laughs> genie in the bottle time. Three wishes for Brian. Anybody, uh, anybody who's watching the video right now would would be probably dying laughing because Brian's over here like wringing his hands together, thinking. I know. Uh, uh, ask like, for it's like a, <laughs> it's like Christmas over here, right? Uh, I told you I was a good company in the beginning. Um, so I, I truly mean this. The number one thing, man, is to keep giving guys like me a shot um, at, you know, being on a platform like this. I, I don't take this lightly by any means. Um, you know, Morgan Ingram in the early days before he became Morgan J. Ingram, uh, he saw something in me, man, and we linked together, and it, it like, it uh, catapulted me into this industry, right? Um, so keep giving guys like me a shot. Um, especially people that look like me. It's not, it's not a lot of brothers out here, you know what I mean, in the sales industry. So the more we can find and bring into this industry, that'd be great. And, and people of diversity just in general. Um, two, for me, uh, I've got a little side hustle called the Sales Collective. Oh, tell, um, us, tell us about this. I don't know anything about the Sales Collective. I've not heard about I that. know, man. I'm so scared to like even mention it because I'm like, I don't know, it's my baby right now. But it's a couple of different things, man. It's, it's really working on a community for um, diverse people who want to get into sales. And I'm even talking about like high schoolers who realize college isn't for them. College wasn't for me. I got lucky uh, because I went through foster care. It was paid for. Right. How many more people are out there that could utilize an SDR gig if someone's willing to teach them? Right. We talk about hustle. A high school kid that can't pay for college, like, you know what I mean? Um, so that's my number one thing. The second thing, like, I just want to shout out to help some companies, right? Like, let me let me put what I know to test, right? And then the third thing the Sales Collective will be is just resources for um, individuals who want to learn more about what we do. How do you do it? How do you have success? I'm all about helping, man. Like, that's great. I love that initiative. You got to keep us posted yeah. on that initiative, and, and you got to start sharing yeah. more on it too. Yeah, for, uh, let us know how we can support that. that this community. is the first place I've ever mentioned this. Like, it's nobody knows about this. You are of my start life, talking. You're speaking it into existence, my friend. That's what we're doing. I know. My heart races. I'm like, damn, what did I just do? <laughs> That's awesome, man. Congrats That's on cool. getting that done. That's really cool to get yeah. that started. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, and the third thing, like, can I just be real? Yes. Yo, if you're a software company hiring, like, holler at your boy. We got SDRs on deck. Like, you know, come talk to me. The best thing I always tell people, like, not only do you get a great product, but you get me too. Like, <laughs> you're looking at this video, you see this face, you hear this voice. Um, but seriously, man, uh, yeah, I think that's it for me. I don't want too much. No, dude, you've got the best voice for phone sales. You really do. Like, it's, I it, it captures people's attention, you know? That's I'm going to get your uh, thoughts on this offline about <laughs> that very exact thing. I don't want to get in too much trouble, but I, I've got some stuff for you. All right. That'd be awesome. I appreciate you spending some time with us, Brian. And it's always good to catch up with you, man. And good luck with everything. And I, I look forward to hearing more about your, uh, your journey. Yeah, see, man, I appreciate it. Seeing how much I can help. Stay in touch. Likewise, Brian. All right.